We'll read 1 Timothy 1, 3 to 6 again, part of our scripture reading. And then we'll focus in on verse 5. But let's begin with verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith and fame, from which some having swerved have turned aside into vain jangling or vain talk. We see here that Paul left Timothy in Ephesus to correct some things that were wanting in the church there. And he reminds them that, as we read in verse 3, that he was supposed to charge some that they teach no other doctrine or to instruct them. Or actually, it's a stronger word than that even. It's to order Tell them to stop teaching doctrine that is false. Uh, we, we, as we read through this letter, we learn that there are false teachers uh, there in Ephesus that were teaching things that did not promote godliness. On the contrary, the, the false teachings uh, undermine Christian, the Christian faith. These false teachers rejected the what Paul refers to as wholesome words of Jesus Christ, instead of teaching sound words or wholesome words that produce godly edifying, which is how he puts it in faith, they taught things that ministered or fostered questions and doubts and ungodly behavior. One lesson that we can take from the, um, well, from Paul's writing especially, actually from the entire Bible, but especially even in this letter, one, one lesson we could take is what you believe informs how you behave. So we see in this letter that Paul conveys very effectively that corrupt teachings produce corrupt behavior, while sound teachings produce godly behavior. We've heard it said that anemic teaching produces an anemic Christian, or weak or watered-down doctrines will produce a weak Christian at best, while healthy doctrine produces healthy Christians. So we see, uh, first, Paul's addressing right off that false doctrine or corrupt teachings need to be addressed. Corrupt teachings produce corrupt behavior. These false teachers were propagating Jewish fables and genealogies and heresies, he names, which are, were contrary to sound doctrine. We'll talk more about what sound doctrine is. But for one, actually in our in scripture reading, verse 9 and 10, uh, Paul actually gives a, a partial list of things that are contrary to sound doctrine. So what is sound doctrine? Sound is healthy doctrine. Well, doctrine is teaching, basically. Every church has doctrine. Even if they don't list it or publish their doctrines, every, even if they, they say, we have no doctrines at our church, that's their doctrine. So, but the doctrines are simply, that's just a word for, uh, and you, you see it through, the, uh, t- through Timothy, the pastoral letters, through 2 Timothy, through, to, also in, in Titus. Uh, but but we, he, Paul notes a partial list. If you want to know what sound doctrine is, these things are contrary to uh, uh, sound doctrine. In verse 9 through 10, he mentions the lawless and disobedient are contrary to sound doctrine. The ungodly and sinners, the unholy and profane or irreverent are contrary or contradict sound doctrine. Murderers and liars, false witnesses, And all kinds of sexual immorality, he he names, all that is contrary to healthy Bible teaching. And that's just a partial list. So how does Paul deal with false doctrine? 
and false teachers. He corrects in this letter the false teachings by appealing to sound doctrine, or in other words, he uses words are trustworthy sayings. Notice in verse 15, he says, this is a faithful saying, or meaning this is a trustworthy saying. This is something you can re a reliable truth, in other words. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation or deserving of acceptance by all. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says, this is a true saying. Again, he's, he's, he's addressing or combating false teachings by saying, here's what the true saying is. In chapter 4, verse 9, he again says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. So sound doctrine is simply healthy teaching, healthy Bible teaching. It's one of the themes throughout this letter. Sound words or healthy words. Healthy or healthful words instead of corrupt words. Sound doctrine is healthy teaching or holy teaching. Bible teaching un uh, without being watered down without being corrupted in any way. Gos the gospel of Jesus Christ, in its totality, it's comprised of sound words. God chose to deliver uh, uh, the message through words. In fact, we know in, in the gospel of John that the word, Jesus is the word, he became flesh. So God came down in the form of the, his son, Jesus Christ, the word became flesh. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is com com comprised of sound words or sound doctrine or holy teachings that produce holy lives or godly behavior. The Bible re refers to the words of God or the Bible in, in, in its entirely as we have it as they're the words of life. Remember when People begin to leave Jesus, and Jesus turns to his disciples, and, and he asks, will you also go away? Are you going to leave too? And Peter responds, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. So the, the word of God is the word of life. The Bible teaches that, says that the word quickens or makes alive. The truth makes us free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The, the truth sanctifies or purifies us. So the gospel is comprised of holy words that produce holy behavior, a holy life. In chapter 1, verse 11, part of our scripture reading, he refers to this uh, sound doctrine. He, he calls it the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. God entrusted me, Paul is saying. I was so undeserving, I was actually persecuting the church. But Christ confronted me, and he entrusted me with this glorious gospel, with this good news, with these, with these words that bring salvation. In I refer to chapter 1, verse 15, where he says, this is a faithful saying or trustworthy saying. What is this saying? Well, here he says, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ came into the world to save sinners. A core, sound teaching. Jesus came to save us from our sins, not to save us in our sins. He, he, he delivers us. If you're drowning in, in a pool and, 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 and you need to be saved or rescued, what good does it do if a lifeguard comes by and says, you're good, I, I declare you saved, and leaves you there in the pool drowning? No, no, no. Jesus comes and plucks us out, lifts us from that miry clay. So the faithful saying is that Jesus came to save us from our sins. In chapter 6 of this letter, verse 3, he describes these sound words or sound doctrine as wholesome words or uncorrupt words. The words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he refers to as the doctrine which is according to godliness. So the wholesome words, this is one of the concepts, because we're going someplace with this. Well, Paul is. <laughs> so the sound words... Sound teachings, healthy Bible teachings, produce healthy Christians, godly Christians, godly behavior, or holy behavior. It's the purpose of biblical teaching, the purpose of, 
God's word and the holy doctrines are to produce godly behavior. The end uh, goal of the gospel is to, the gospel of Jesus Christ, of course, is to produce a holy life. And then actually, if you read through this letter, you see that in the others uh, of Paul and throughout the Bible, we see that godly life manifests itself somehow. Isn't that true? What is inside comes out. So a godly life, a, a heart that is uh, righteous and holy, while well, produces good behavior or godly behavior. And it actually mentions this, that, that, that our holy life is manifested through godly behavior, through, through good words, uh, uh, uncorrupt words, and even modest appearance. In chapter 2, he refers to that. Um, modesty is a Bible doctrine. How it's applied, you know, there may, may be some vari variations by culture. But remember, in the Garden of Eden, after they sinned, Jesus killed innocent animals to clothe Adam and Eve. So there are some things that God uh, decided that, or uh, took note and, and established that there are some things that need to be covered. But if we take this, let's think about godliness and holiness. What does it mean to be godly? Does it mean to follow some rules? Does it mean to just simply stay away from sinful behavior and do good behavior and perhaps even guard our, what comes out of our mouth and dress a certain way? Is that what godliness is in its, in its entirety? No. So here's where we're, we're going to focus on verse 5, which if, if we look a little deeper at what the pure words, the gospel of Jesus Christ is designed to do, is look in verse 5. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and a faith unfeigned. We're going to focus on those three things separately. But first of all, the gospel we know is, uh, produces godliness. But if you peel back and you look at the core, the essence of Christianity is love. The essence of Christianity is that agape love, that divine love, God-given. The very essence of godliness. What is godliness? Is it just following some rules? Is being holy just looking right, looking acceptable to the church? No, no, no. It's much deeper than what, yes, it does manifest itself on the outside. Yes, when we are made righteous, our words are words that minister grace. Yes, for sure. It comes out. But there's something on the inside. And we see that the end of the commandment. So you could say the end of the commandment is Paul's commandment in this letter. But really, it's, uh, he's speaking of the, the gospel as an, in, in, in its entirety. The, the whole Old Testament and New Testament. You don't have to read the entire Bible to know the main point or what, how it can be all uh, uh, summarized. It can be condensed into two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. So Paul says, the end of the commandment is charity, agape love. So the very essence of uh, the gospel, the very essence of godliness is agape love. The very essence of holiness is pure love. And so he says, now the end of the commandment, verse 5, is charity out of a pure heart. So pure heart, charity out of a pure heart uh, and of a good conscience and faith and fame. So the purity of the gospel is love that flows out of a pure heart, love that flows out of a good conscience or a clear conscience, and love that flows out of a, a faith and fame, which means genuine faith. We'll talk about these three things, pure heart, good conscience, and faith and fame. We'll take them backwards. So, the end of the commandment is charity. That's the end goal. God God's word must produce love. Do you love your Savior? The old song, uh, uh, I love the old time religion, it makes me love everyone. Are you in love with Jesus? Not like you love money, not like you love your job, but uh, not like you love your car, not like you love your house, but are, not even how, as you love your spouse. There's a love that must be more supreme than any other love, and it's for our Savior. That's what the genuine faith, in fact, we see in the Scripture that faith produces love. Genuine faith. So the end of the commandment is charity out of a 
faith and fame. In fact, verse 14 of chapter 1 mentions that uh, of grace abundant. God has given us grace abundant with faith and love. So Timothy knew what unfeigned faith was. He did. We do too. Second Timothy, we could turn to chapter 1, verse 5. Second letter he wrote to uh, Timothy. He begins, he says, I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. So unfeigned, unfeigned means authentic or genuine or sincere, unaltered, uncorrupted, uncorrupted or without hypocrisy. I call to remembrance. And so Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says, I remember something. I saw it in you. Notice this. It's almost like something tangible. I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that it's in thee also. He's describing this unfeigned faith, this authentic, authentic faith that is a gift from God. When we are saved, the Bible tells us that uh, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. So this genuine or unfeigned faith is a gift from God that must be preserved, which we look, we'll look at. So unfeigned faith, Timothy possessed it. And, and Paul says, I see it in you. And it wasn't, it's, a, it's faith is a substance. You can see it in a person when they have a connection with God. They've been uh, made alive. And it would dwelt in your grandmother and also in your mother. And now it's in you also. It can be passed on to your children. That's what we want to pass on. Genuine faith. Unfeigned faith. So Paul says that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the end, commandment, uh, end of the commandment. The end goal is that there would be love that flows out of an unfeigned faith out of genuine faith. In fact, Romans 5.5 5 says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. When we are saved, the word shed abroad there is he infuses us with love. When you pray and you find forgiveness for your sins and you know that burden, first you must be convicted. The Holy Spirit will convict us of our sins through our conscience, which we'll look at momentarily. And, and we recognize our need for a Savior. And when we cry out for forgiveness, he that is forgiven much loveth much. When the Lord forgives us of our sins, he infuses us with the love. He fills us with the love, the love of God. It's not an earthly love. It's not a human love. It's a divine love that flows the moment we are saved, there's instantly a love that God put in us to, that is returned towards him. He, we love him because he first loved us. So the gospel produces a love. And, and Paul says that the end of the commandment, the end of the gospel, the goal of the gospel is that there would be love that flows out of a genuine faith. Number two, so there's three things. End of the commandment is charity out of a good conscience. Or love the gospel must and thus produce love that flows out of a good conscience or a clear conscience. A conscience, our conscience is a blessing from God. It is. Our conscience informs us. Our conscience talks to us, doesn't it? If it's, a, it's still healthy, it says you shouldn't be doing this or you should be doing that. You know you're not living right. Our conscience, God's gift to us to let us know that we're not measuring up to his righteousness or we are living to the light we know. We are living in a way that is pleasing unto him. Our conscience will speak to us. So Paul says the gospel, the end of the commandment is charity that flows out of a good conscience. A conscience can also be weak or seared or defiled. So sometimes people will say, my conscience doesn't bother me. Or they'll say, oh, you know, yeah, it's fine. You could stay away from such and such, whatever that is. But I, it doesn't bother me, so I'm clear. Well, a lie should go on in our mind. Could it be that my conscience is a little seared, dulled, and it doesn't have the same effect? 
God and the intents to, to have in our lives, to, in our spiritual life. So, what do we do? Sins committed produce a guilty conscience. When we're not saved, when we're not living right, our sins uh, weigh on us and in our conscience. And notice Hebrews 9.14 says that the blood of Jesus will purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So when we're saved, God, through the blood of Jesus, purges our conscience, removes those, those sins committed. We are justified. We stand before God innocent. So remember, back to the, the, the key verse in, our, in, in the message this morning. Charity is, the end goal is charity that flows out of uh, unfeigned faith, genuine faith, saving faith, and a clear conscience. What a blessing it is when we could go before God with a clear conscience. You know, you don't know, uh, we, we don't know the, the blessing or the, or the closeness we can have with God if there's things that are uh, uh, not right. We need to be reconciled, made right with God. But when everything is clear between us and God, Paul said in Acts 24, I exercise myself. And, or I conduct myself in, in a way that I may have a conscience void of offense towards God and towards man. I live in a way that my conscience is always clear. I'm preserving a, a good conscience because the end of the commandment is charity out of a good conscience. That's what the gospel produces. Yes, it's a gift, that clear conscience, or that good conscience, uh, um, when he cleanses us, purges our, dead, uh, our conscience from dead works, the things that we committed, that's a gift from God. But then we must preserve. We must live, like Paul says, exercise ourselves in a way that we maintain, preserve a clear conscience. So the last n note here. By the way, I will say I, was re I read across came across a note from Suzanne Wesley. You know she, who she was? We, we, we hear a lot about uh, uh, John Wesley and Charles Wesley. Oh, Suzanne we Wesley was a godly woman. She was a godly woman that taught her kids to live right. And she warned her son John Wesley of the danger, uh, speaking to the conscience, and she, she warned John Wesley, of the danger of anything, as she wrote it, that weakens your reason, impairs your tenderness of your conscience, ob obscures your sense of God, or takes off the relish of spiritual things, however innocent it may be. So guard things that may weaken your reason, your conscience, that impairs the tenderness. Guard your conscience. Keep it tender towards God. Treat it, uh, if, if it grieves God, it grieves me. Pray prayers like that. Lord, I want to love you in a way that I guard my life. I live in a way that, uh, that, uh, that my conscience is clear towards you and towards others. I want to live in a way that, that shows love, that your love flows through me to others. Finally, the end of the commandment, he says, there's charity out of a pure heart. Our heart is the whole of our inner being. Our purpose, our will, our motivation, our affections, that's the, 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 the seat of our being. The headquarters of our being is our heart. And, and, and Paul said that the goal of the gospel is to produce love, charity, that flows out of a pure heart. A pure heart. What is pure water? Water that has been purified. The heart is not pure when we're first born in this world. In fact, Jeremiah, te uh, we read that uh, um, the heart is desperately wicked. Uh, th this heart is born with a carnal nature, a so sinful nature that man itself, uh, manifests itself with actions that, uh, that are against God's word, that defy God. But God intends through the gospel to produce Charity that flows out of a pure heart. So a pure heart must be a cleansed heart. Just like pure water, there's pure heart. A heart that has been purged, sanctified through the blood of Jesus. A pure heart is a single-minded, a pure heart wills one thing, has only one desire. 
when God removes that conflict that we're born with. After we're saved, that carnal nature is still there. It may not be as active as before, but it's still there. It needs to be purged, sanctified. And when that carnality is removed, our heart uh, only wills one thing. What is that? It's to love God. It's an undivided heart, a pure heart. Uh, uh, so the gospel is designed, and is it doing this in your life? Has it produced charity? Is it producing charity that flows out of a pure heart? The very essence of the gospel is agape love. The very essence of holiness is love that flows out of a unfeigned faith, a good conscience, and out of a pure heart. So this morning, we take the lesson from the scripture and a prayer we could pray. I've heard people say, pray that God will help me know God's will for my life. Have you ever prayed that way? Lord, I want to know your will for my life. Well, you want to know God's will for your life? God's will for our lives is to, to love him supremely. He wants to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us, bring us in the place of, uh, uh, of unity and intimacy and love. So we can pray, Lord, infuse me with your love. Lord, let the love of God flow freely in me, to me, and, and then from the love that you put in my heart, let it flow out both towards you and towards others. Help me to love you and to love others with sincerity of faith. Help me to love you. Lord, help me to love you with a clear conscience. And help me to love you with total loyalty, with a pure heart. No ulterior motives. We're going to have a time to pray. And we invite you to kneel where you are or come forward and pray. And number 656 is the number. God bless you as you take time to, to visit with the Lord this morning.